Hi, I'm Chris Chimicles, president of Angie and Group, and welcome to our Leading Litigators series. Our series brings together some of the best and brightest class action practitioners from both the plaintiffs and defense bars, and most importantly, the attorneys that made case law. Enjoy our series. Hi, I'm Steve Weisbrot. Thank you for joining us today for another edition of Angian's Leading Litigator video series. I'm here today with Adam Levitt. Adam is a director at Grant and Eisenhofer, and he is the head of the Consumer Litigation Practice Group. Thank you for joining us today, Adam. Thanks very much, Steve. Happy to be here. Adam, you've had a long and illustrious career representing plaintiffs in some of the most complex consumer class actions our country has seen. Um, as a result of that, you're fairly well versed in multi-district litigation practice, and I would, I would like to hear, and I know that our viewers would really um, gain some knowledge in, in your opinion as to the current state of multi-district litigation in this country. Sure. Thanks very much, Steve. I've been involved in multi-district litigation for going on a, about 15 or, or 20 years right now, and I've been lead in about 17 or 18 of the largest MDLs in the United States. Including, including a number of them right now. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting seeing the shift, I think, in the MDL, or more specifically, more accurately, the JPML panel, in the way they look at cases, in the way that MDL cases have spread in lots of ways, and I think the effect on jurisprudence and case management across the United States. I think that one of the things that's happened over the past number of years, I think we've seen a market shift from the JPML transferring almost everything to a situation where they're transferring many fewer cases, asking the litigants to instead try to focus on 1404A or other sorts of coordination rather than MDL transfer under 1407. And I think that has both positive and negative effects. I think that the negative effect is that when you don't have a 1407 transfer, you have a situation where you lack the ability of sending the constituent cases within the MDL back to the originating courts for trial. You lose that strong strategic advantage, I think, or strategic option, and you also lose the ability to have nationwide subpoena power, which you have in a transferred case under 1407. And I, but I think also the larger problem that's happened with now the MDLs, every large case, and I think this is largely an effect of the ECF and online newsletters like the Law 360 series and those sorts of things is that everyone knows what everybody else is doing. And unfortunately, the transaction cost of actually getting a new case on file for a lot of people is very, very low. So you wind up in a situation where what would have been in years past, six or seven or eight law firms filing a case, uh, instead now in certain of the larger MDLs that are out there, a hundred law firms on the plaintiff side putting in cases. And that results in all sorts of inefficiencies in that it creates in a lot of ways a sub-industry of the Harris-Martin conferences, the AAJ conferences around the MDL hearings. And I think we all spend lots of money and lots of time of doing the organizational game, which some of us are doing or better than others, but it's a waste of time and it's time that could really be spent litigating the actual case rather than A, figuring out where the case is going to be litigated, and number two, or B, figuring out who you're going to be litigating the case with. Now, while I understand it's certainly the way of the world these days, the world is certainly an imperfect one, and one that I think is reaching a stage where some sort of change is going to have to occur because there has to be a better way. I know the JPML judges, they take their jobs very, very seriously. It's a prestigious appointment, it's an important appointment, and 
and I appreciate from the number of times that I've been in front of the JPML being able to engage in actually sometimes relatively substantive and nuanced conversations with them. And I think they're putting in the work to understand where the cases should be. I think that on the other side though, um, all the lawyers who are jockeying to figure out where it should be, as I said a minute ago, there has to be a better way. Interesting. Adam, the consumer class action practice is often painted with a brush that it's Wall Street versus Main Street. Is that, is that the right analogy? Is, is that what's going on today? Unfortunately, I guess first, the short answer is it shouldn't be what's going on, but I think in some ways it's exactly what's going on. The Chamber of Commerce, the Defense Research Institute, the Washington Legal Foundation have all been very, very successful in staying on message in trying to create the framework whereby Wall Street or the American companies are working very hard to improve the lives of, of the American people while a group of, of opportunistic plaintiff's lawyers are simply trying to seek their own fees or to enrich themselves for claims that, for problems that don't really exist. Uh, that's simply false. Uh, and it's just, if you really look at what, bleh, if you really look at what the situation is, that's just not the way it should be. The fact is, the American way is that if you make a mistake, you fix it. If you create a problem, you solve that, that problem. What the American way is not is to create a defective product and then argue that you shouldn't be held responsible for that, that product because after all, someone might have used it the wrong way. Someone might not have actually had the actual harm happen to him or her yet. And again, that's not what the American legal system and justice system, and frankly, the American way is all about. If you've created a defective product, you are responsible to fix that product. Don't tell a consumer it's their fault, it's your fault. And the fact is that the only way to get true, true justice for the, the American consumers in most situations is through an aggregate vehicle, the class action vehicle, the mass tort vehicle, because in lots of situations, the value of the product in question is not large enough to hire your own lawyer on an hourly basis and go up against the Fortune 100 companies represented by the Amlaw 100 law firms. Uh, the playing field has been incre incredibly tilted away from U.S. consumers' interests, and one thing that we do every day is fight to rebalance that playing field. We do the work. If you look at the history of what we've done on the consumer litigation side of things, the antitrust litigation side, the securities litigation side, we represent the interests of people who otherwise would be unable to pursue their, their claims individually. And the results are clear. We live in a, a safer country as a result of a lot of the work we have done. Adam, ascertainability is a doctrine we're, we're seeing a large rise of, especially following Carrera, and we've seen a lot of different courts interpreting Carreras in different ways. Um, how do you feel about ascertainability? Where do you think it's going? Um, what can we expect? Ascertainability is one of those things where a non-issue or really something that is what should be a low hurdle has now become, as a result of the Third Circuit's ruling in Carrera, a much higher hurdle, that, and one that's really a higher hurdle now because of rampant overreading and misinterpretation by the defense bar and, frankly, by the courts as well. The entire ascertainability principle or doctrine, which is not in the federal rules, as we all know, it's a judge-created rule, is that you should be able, that a defendant should be able to know what its exposure is at the class certification stage. So the issue is whether the class itself is ascertainable. All purchasers of X, for example, 
An objective definition. Yes, an objective definition. What it's not supposed to be is a requirement that you have to identify objectively each class member at the class of certification stage. Uh, in fact, actually, the Third Circuit in Carrera didn't even go that far. I believe that there the issue is whether it's more likely than not that someone is in the, the class. And I think we've seen a lot of litigation since then, and the courts around the country have largely upheld the original ascertainability principles, notwithstanding the spin being put on it by people, again, at the chamber and at DRI, et cetera. I think that the fundamental understanding of ascertainability that a defendant should understand and be able to know what their exposure is at class cert is exactly what it should be. Because the issue is that if you're going to require a class member, especially a class member in a small dollar consumable product case, a can of soda, uh, a bottle of aspirin, to have saved a receipt or to have saved the product packaging in order to be in the class or in order for a class to be certified, you are never going to have um, a class action for a, a, a low dollar consumable. And if you don't have that, what you've now, what you've now accomplished is you've given the manufacturers of those products a license to steal, in other words. They can create a defective product and say, we don't know who's in the class. We're not re responsible for what we've done. And that's not what the law is. That's not what the purpose of the law is. And certainly that's not what the purpose of the underlying ascertainability principles is. Great. Thank you very sure. much.